All right, so this video is going to talk about some other forms of physical control um, that can be used to control microbial growth. So the first one here is desiccation, and that's where you're just dehydrating um, cells. You're, you're pulling water out of the cells. Um, and so this can actually be used to preserve a lot of foods because by reducing the amount of water available, right, the bacterial, fungal cells, whatever, cannot support growth because they need water to survive. So if you've dehydrated your food, there's just not any water there uh, to support microbial growth. So desiccation is dehydration of those cells, okay? And Norton Lotus, it's directly exposed to normal room air, okay? So there's nothing to do with temperature or anything like that with this. It's simply removing the water so that microbes don't have access to it. The next um, is water activity. This is also referred to as like osmotic pressure um, because, and those like hypertonicity, or you know, um, hypotonicity, um, same thing that's what we're getting at here. Because remember, if you put um, something like a microbe, a bacteria, in a super sugary or super salty solution, plasma lysis is going to occur, which will result in cell death. Um, and I, I apologize, I, I didn't change this second bullet here. Um, it's identical to the one above it, so I apologize for that. Um, but just know this is, uh, we talked about how people would salt meats to create a hypertonic environment so that plasma lysis would occur. Same thing with those stored in a sugary syrup in the grocery store, and that's because it's creating a hypertonic environment. So the fruit will be fine, but any bacteria that were trapped in that fruit cup will die uh, because of the hypertonic sugary solution. So next up is lyophilization, and that is going to be um, kind of a way that we actually preserve um, microbes. So it's this combination of freezing and drying. So remember we just talked about with freezing, um, no microbial growth is happening. So the, the bacterial cells, for instance, may not die, but there's no growth. Okay, so you can freeze a sample of bacteria, for instance, and ship it to another lab in the same city, across the city, even in a different country. And when they receive the sample, there's a specific way that they can essentially unfreeze and dry the cells and then have the cells in a viable functional state. And so, um, Lyophilization is a really good way to, you know, keep the cells intact and make them viable once they're unfrozen. Okay, so that's um, pretty neat. And so in order to do lyophilization, um, you're going to freeze the culture and then immediately use a vacuum to remove the water. Okay, so it's a combination of freezing and drying. And so a lot of times um, you can see it kind of as like a little powdery substance. Um, some people do transfer them as like little frozen tubes on dry ice. Um, but so lyophilization is you first freeze the culture and then you dry it by removing excess water. All right, next up is radiation as a form of microbial control. And so with radiation, um, basically, energy is being emitted from various devices, and it's released at very high velocity. That's going to go through, you know, space and any matter that it um, encounters. And so, there's two types of radiation here that you need to be familiar with. Non-ionizing radiation is shown at the top right. And so, with that, these uh, this type of radiation, right, can penetrate through a barrier. It can enter into a microbial cell, and it's actually going to cause breaks in the DNA. Okay, so that's ionizing radiation. With non-ionizing radiation, it doesn't lead to breaks in the DNA. It leads to abnormal bonds, which are called thymine dimers. So if you look at the picture on the bottom left, notice that the normal base pairing gets messed up. 
right? On the right hand side, you see adenine paired with thymine and guanine paired, um, with, I'm sorry, and the other thymine paired with um, adenine on the left. But then notice what starts to happen. Guanines are pairing together, um, cytosines are pairing together, that's not good. But what really throws things off are the neighboring thymines forming bonds together. And we call these thymine dimers. Okay, and this is going to cause like bulges in the um, DNA. It's going to warp the overall structure of the DNA. So it's not going to be able to function as it should. Because remember, structure and function go hand in hand. So when DNA structure gets warped, um, it's unable to be used as it normally would. Okay, so two different types of radiation here and two different two different forms of um, uh, uh, just lost my train of thought. Two different forms of action. All right. Uh, last method of physical control that we're going to talk about is going to be decontamination by filtration. And so um, using a filter, which has these tiny little pores, like you can see on the bottom, um, the filter is the green background. You can see those little holes in it. And then in this case, it's Staphylococcus aureus. That's on top of it, those pretty gold cells that you see. Notice the Staphylococcus aureus is much larger than those little pore sizes. And so um, you can use a filter to remove microbes from liquids because the liquid can pass through those little holes, but the microbes can't, and to remove microbes from air as well, right? Because um, gases can fit through there as well, whereas the bacteria in this case can't. And so again, you can, there are different methods of, you know, filtering liquid through. There's a larger contraption at the top, so you can pour your liquid um, into that top region. You can see the white filter there, and then you would turn that machine on. A lot of times it has like a vacuum approach where it's going to suck the liquid down through the filter and into that bottom container. Or there can be, if, you have a, if you're working with a smaller volume, you can use the syringe method that you see there. So the the liquid is in the, the syringe part, and then it's going to pass through that uh, white green structure, which has a filter in it. And so most filters have very precise, uniform size pores, and you can get different filters that have different sized pores um, to make sure that you can filter out whatever it is you're after. So if you're concerned that you're going to have, you know, Staphylococcus aureus, then you would make sure you select a pore size that is smaller than the size of the bacteria. And so um, smaller pores can actually achieve sterilization um, by blocking out things like viruses and large proteins and whatnot. Um, so we also use filtration for liquids that can't withstand heat. OK, because um, and this is common in things like pharmaceuticals, where you have some sort of antimicrobial drug that you need to isolate maybe from a liquid. But the drug, if exposed to high heat, would degrade or change shape and no longer be functional. So if you're dealing with something that is heat sensitive, like antimicrobial drugs, then you're going to want to filter them rather than blast them with heat. And filtration is an alternative method um, for decontaminating certain beverages as well. Um, and it's also used in things like water purification and removing airborne contaminants. So filtration can be very effective, but it is harder to do at a larger scale um, and a bit more time consuming, you know, than pasteurization or something like that. But it is a viable um, option. All right. Well, that is the end of our discussion on types of physical control. Uh, the next video is going to focus on chemical uh, agents being used um, to control microbial growth.